Today, I've got a really special guest on who happens to be both a, a great friend of mine and also an early member of Chameleon Collective. Uh, I first met him uh, when he was uh, freelancing at one of his jobs, and I was uh, the CMO of a company called Kairos. He then went on to become an early member of Chameleon Collective and is now actually a, a partner and a leader of our Amazon practice. Uh, he's held digital marketing roles at companies like Intralinx, uh, Nokia, MTV, and before that, he even spent some time in the music biz at Hopeless Records, but we're going to get more into that in a moment. Uh, throughout his career, he's been passionate about innovating from adopting new technologies to rethinking new approaches to classic problems, sometimes to great success and sometimes creating uh, some big challenges. Uh, in my experience, that's the nature of being a bit of a punk rock marketer. So when it comes to innovation, what's too late, what's too soon, or what's just right? You're going to find out more on today's episode of O-Ship with Josh Hay. And here we go with another week of O-Ship. Josh, welcome to Ship. How are you? Buddy, I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. I've been dying to have you on the show for ages, so I'm glad to uh, glad to get you on here so we can uh, geek out as you and I are prone to doing, uh, but now with other people uh, watching. Uh, mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, uh, for those of you just tuning in, again, as I mentioned, Josh is, is both a friend and colleague of mine, uh, and, I, and I mean this as a huge compliment, but when I talk to people at Josh, I'm like, and I mean, I've said this to his face. I'm like, Josh is a huge nerd. And I mean that in the highest possible compliment in the sense that he like every cool new tech, every growth marketing hack that comes out, Josh is all over this stuff. Uh, and so I love that he's always got a you know, strong point of view on these things. But before we dig into all of that, I really want to dig into uh, you've got a really cool backstory, which is why we you know, talked about this kind of concept of a, a punk, punk rock marketer. So uh, can, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, your start in the music biz? Sure. Um, actually, when I graduated from university, I didn't get a job right away. I thought, oh, I'd get a job for sure. It was, you know, in the 2000s and uh, my dad owned a trophy store and it was great. And one of the things that he made were personalized gold records as gag gifts. And as many of my friends, unfortunately, know, because he gives them out to everyone, he <laughs> sell them and give them out. And I always have had like a strong like will to work. I've always, I, I enjoy working. I enjoy accomplishing things and working on things. And, um, I would go out, I, I would work as his delivery boy and I would deliver, you know, I'd straight out of university, I'd deliver trophies or pieces to anyone who needed a delivery. And that was part of my job. And I'd carry my resume with me. And one of the times it was a record label, hopeless records, which is a, a great label. And it was a great opportunity. And, uh, I brought my resume there and they're like, we're hiring two people in marketing. I'm like, awesome. And. I think it was four interviews later. There's a lot of them. I, I, ma I made it through and uh, I was part of their their marketing team and probably one of the first people to focus uh, more on digital than other work um, yeah. due to kind of like the shifting atmosphere in the music yeah. industry at that point. What, out of interest, what, what kind of bands were on, on Hopeless? Um, their biggest band that I worked with is a band called Avenged Sevenfold. They're a... Yeah. Very large Very metal cool. band. They yeah. play stadiums now. They toured with Metallica. So awesome. that was probably the largest band that yeah, I yeah. worked with. And then they worked with like a, a lot of other, I, you know, punk rock bands. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's cool. And, and, uh, yeah, but they, we we worked with other bands that also like they were, they're an independent label. So they would upstream bands. That's kind of one of the terms yeah, yeah, where they would work with bands and a band, you know, they had bands that went to Island Records or Warner Brothers and places like Very that. Cool. And so how'd you make the jump to growth marketing? So when I was working at Hopeless, there weren't people doing a lot of the digital stuff. And there were like a lot of opportunities happening in the space. iTunes is just coming out. It was really the glory days of MySpace. And mm. I remember I once went to a MySpace party at UCLA and Tom from MySpace was there and 23, uh, 23 people, I think I counted, were in the room. And it was like top from my face, awkwardly sitting in a corner. 
23 people um, or it was in Westwood were hanging out in this party. So pretty much what I tried to do was attach myself to things I thought were interesting, fun, but had an yeah. opportunity to drive growth. Right. So um, I started working with uh, I started working with a lot of um, websites and other areas. There was a, a really highly trafficked website called Absolute Punk that I was always trying to work with that was very popular that we had a bunch of advertisements and features on. But uh, what I really started doing is more and more growth marketing. And from there, I kind of my career evolved. And I started work. And after Hopeless, I decided that I wanted to work in something that was a little bit less music industry yeah. and a little bit more like I want to expand my like yeah. capabilities a bit. And, I, and that's kind of how it started blossoming. I, I, I have to ask, because I don't know anyone else that's met Tom from MySpace. Does, I, I can only vision him in the one headshot of my space or like the certain, I think it had a little bit of a slight turn. I think it was actually this way. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, does he just wear that shirt and are you allowed to approach him from different directions or only like, can you only recognize him from that one angle or is it like, he's just like another person at that point? I, it was, this was early on. So it wasn't <laughs> like a big thing. So uh, he was just kind of sitting, I remember just sitting in a chair, hanging out with a drink, but uh I, I was able to recognize him because yeah. I I was hoping he'd be there. Yeah. So, you, you, think, you know, it's funny at that time. I love the fact that they were like nothing when you when you first you know met him like in that context. But it, that has to be if you think about be like one of the most famous now like headshots or like profile pics of all time. You know what I mean? For sure. Like I wonder, like even like Mark Zuckerberg, like. He has his face, forward facing one. Yeah, but, but he kind of changed it around. Like, Tom had like the shot and he never yeah. changed it. <laughs> so. Yeah, he never yeah. changed it. And well, he was everyone's friend. Yeah. Right? yeah. You know, so he was the first friend when you signed up. His profile would automatically be there. Awesome. I love it. So I want to jump back to growth marketing. And again, some people watching right now may not even understand what that is. So let's, let's just do a little bit of table uh, level setting. What, what falls in growth marketing for you? So it it's a different, I would say it's a different definition for a lot of people, but mm -hmm. I it's believe- It's a big umbrella people, now, I feel like. I'm sorry? It's like a big tent now. It's got a lot, yeah, lot of stuff. I, I look at it as a big tent. There are certain people mm -hmm. that look at it as only as media. I, I look at it as any marketing activity that you can execute to grow your business. And mm -hmm. I would say it includes media, SEO, communications, um, especially outbound communications like uh, email marketing, SMS marketing, um, and even website optimization. Like mm -hmm. if you're if you if you run a campaign and you need your landing pages to be better, I see that as part of growth marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and I you know I see kind of like thankfully throughout my career I've had a chance to not only work in all these areas, I've also had a chance to, like when I left Hopeless, I, I worked at a, a small agency called Future Now run by Brian and Jeffrey Eisenberg, who are like big marketing gurus. And what I kind of learned from there is making everything like data-based, like data-driven marketing, mm -hmm. because most, not all, most activities in growth marketing can be measured. And we live in a world of measurement now. Mm -hmm. So like, when you have to go back to your board and say, hey, we spent all this money or we did all these activities, you can go back and say, here are the results that we were able to track. Here's some other assumptions we had to make because like if you're running like audio ads, you can get some measurement, but not all. Like TV, there's some measurement, but not all. And you can kind of build out plans from there. Do, do, I always get this sense that you love it. Do you, do you love it? Do you love growth marketing? I love it. I love it for sure. And I, I mean, there's definitely kind of like this, uh, endor like you get these endorphins from it's like, like a movies. game, right? I yeah, get like a it game. Is, like it a is. Game it's very much like, it. it's very yeah. much like a game. Right. And, yeah. but cause it, cause the data is like points and you're like, how high can I make this go? Or how good can I make this number? And so it's like a puzzle that you're trying to like, you know, solve. I, I, I get that same vibe off of it. I get like I, 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 I uh, like it fires off endorphins for me to see like rankings rise or whatever. I, I totally feel the same way. Yeah, but 
it's a higher it's like a higher risk thing too yeah. so that means <laughs> you have to be a little bit more responsible it's not yeah. like yeah, yeah that that's that's the thing right yeah, so yeah. Actually, I'm what you mean playing with tens of millions of dollars of people's media budgets, not just like playing Super Mario Brothers, Josh? No, no, okay, like <laughs> just, just checking. No, I'm <laughs> Actually, I, I heard something early on in my career which it really resonated with me, and I don't remember who said it, so excuse me if I misquote, okay. but I, I was told once to be a good growth marketer, you need to have empathy and you need to, you need to have like the best from what i was told like the best ones you know have a strong connection and feeling to what they're doing because if you don't care you can become very easily reckless and mm -hmm. you need to also have that humility which happens when you mm -hmm. you know make mistakes and mm -hmm. it definitely happens and no one's perfect and there are there are slip ups that happen in your career and mm -hmm. uh, you know it's always about finding the best ways to quickly react and find the best ways of fixing things and also setting yourself up to have mm. minimal risk as well, mm -hmm. building out campaigns. Mm. So. It's a, that's a good, good segue. Um, I love that you touched on kind of the, um, the mindset you want to have. Um, and, and again, I, I don't mind you know, kind of showering you with praise because everything, everything I'm about to say is, is true. You really are one of the best growth marketers I've ever had a chance to work with and, and probably one of the best I've seen. I've seen you deliver some kind of incredible results for people. Um, what is it about your approach that you think is different from maybe how a traditional growth marketer may approach things that's letting you kind of knock these numbers out of the park so frequently? I, I think some of the things I do differently are part of kind of where I've ended up as a unique position in my career. So I'm very lucky to have worked at a variety of both, actually both B2B and B2C clients and companies. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten to be able to do different things at each of them and work mm -hmm. in different channels. And what I really like to do is I do like to do upfront strategy. And I do like to think about how we are going to work and find the ways to, when working with any company or any project, Think up front, like, here are the things that we want to accomplish. Here's how we can potentially accomplish them. And mm -hmm. I like to be able to build out some of it on my own so that, you know, I can be part of the end to end. Right. And sometimes there's a loss in translation if, you know, because sometimes people just hand things off and then it doesn't always mm -hmm. doesn't always come as intended. I can at least say that the strategy I deliver gets implemented in the way I intend and it doesn't always work as best as possible. And sometimes we shift like, you know, even, you know, even small things like sometimes clients are like, Hey, let's test this. And I'm like, it doesn't always work. And we test it, you know, like, and it works better. And I'm like, Hey, you know what? We tested it. That's the goal. Get information, yeah. right? Like sometimes I don't like doing Instagram only ads and, you know, I've tested it for a client <laughs> recently and it worked really well for their products. So, you know, it's, it's it it all depends. I'd love to you you know you mentioned a second ago that look it doesn't always work out every time and I think that's a big spirit about you know what today's episode's about that you know you uh, uh, what's what's the old saying like, you know got to break a couple eggs to make an omelet kind of thing like you know and, yeah. and, and sometimes you you know you can't get big rewards sometimes without without um, you know big ri risks sometimes those risks can be excessive and 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 we've got to watch out for that um, but let, let's let's start with the basics. Can you give me some examples of where um, maybe you've adopted new technologies a bit of the head of the curve? And I guess this is your oh ship question, right? Like, you know, so, uh, you know, some where you maybe adopted something a bit ahead of the curve and, and maybe it didn't work out exactly how you'd intended. I actually have a job that I felt that that was the way. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the amazing. Whole You're like, it was an entire year? It or was an entire three? two years. So oh I, my I, God. When, when I worked at Nokia, it was uh, honestly an amazing culture company. They've been through a lot of changes in the last 10 years. But when I started there, I worked for Nokia Music, which had a product called Comes With Music. It's free streaming music to your phone, right? Yeah. This was pre-Spotify. It's a free I, smartphone, proper smartphone too, right? Yeah, it was. It, no, iPhones were just hitting. iPhone okay. two was hitting and starting to gain momentum, yeah. right? So, 
even then data wasn't fast, right? So they were hoping that people use Wi-Fi with their phones, which wasn't a thing that was happening. That, that adoption wasn't fully happening yet. Like people weren't doing Wi-Fi with their phones. Cause like, you know, they weren't also doing messaging on their phone. There wasn't like iMessage or Google Hangouts or things like that. So like that whole product, Nokia comes with music. It launched in 20 countries. And I felt that that was one year too soon, right? It was just like one year too soon and a little bit too advanced for the technology. And, you know, I know this podcast will probably be on Spotify, but like I remember when I was at Nokia getting like a, international invite to Spotify and trying it out on a work trip and, you know, kind of thinking like, wow, this is a huge potential competitor. Right. And, you know, it was, it was very interesting. So I, I felt like that was too soon because like, and, and I think I see this a lot in, in the web three world, um, the blockchain world where there's a lot of too soon that we've seen since like 2017. Um, and I don't, and, you know, sometimes it's, infrastructure so for like the nokia music project product i definitely think it was partly infrastructure partly you know product you know there, there's lots of things but when it comes to blockchain there's also like too soon because you need this level of adoption and usability that isn't necessarily there yet for mainstream adoption to make things fully usable like you know, I, I always like to do like the parent test. Sometimes if you want something to be huge. <laughs> Sorry, Freddie, I think I couldn't I couldn't hear you there. I said, what's the what's the parent test? The parent test is you could send if you could send it to your parent and they could figure out how to do it with minimal help, then you've got something that has great usability. Right. That's, that's actually a you know, it's awesome test. I actually I couldn't agree I, with that more. I if I can send something to my mom, even though she's too afraid to put credit cards online, I still love you, mom. But <laughs> <laughs> but if she could figure out how to get to that checkout page, yeah. then you know you've done a good job. And I feel like that. I love that. I, you know, it's so funny. I, I I think I think the parent test. That's such a simple uh, simple way of thinking about it. It's so true. You know, I, I spend a lot a lot of, a lot of times. Like my mom is eighty four and lives with my wife and I. Again, it's like if she can make it through it, you nailed it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, straight you up nailed it right if she can yeah. figure out to buy something even like through her phone or through her or just through her uh you know device whether it's an ipad a laptop mm -hmm. whatever it is that's that's kind of it's it's that is the lowest common denominator of making something a hundred percent usable right yeah. and even better if you can convince them to click on an ad which, yeah. you know, that, that's a whole nother level. But yeah, yeah, that's how I see it. And I think with a lot of blockchain technology and Web3, I don't think we're we're close to that. Mm -hmm. We're like one level even beyond the parent test. Like mm -hmm. it's probably like your best friend test, like mm -hmm. someone who might be kind of digital, but not super yeah. digital yeah. and trying to be able to teach them something. I think because we're still at that level, it makes that also makes things too soon. One, one, one of my favorite expressions in that when I, when I, you know, obviously I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of startup founders and, and I try and share whatever I've learned along the way. And one of the biggest ones is, is talking about a, a solution in search of a problem. And I think people see these, especially guys like you and I who really geek out on, on new tech and like love, 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 love innovation. And, and you want to apply it to something but maybe there's not a problem there. And so, you know, so it's a it's classic, a solution search your problem. And then it's like, you know, because it doesn't actually have real product market fit, it doesn't really like nail some big solution for people. It kind of, you know, falls on its face a bit. Um, you know, and I think that's another thing, that, you know, uh, I have to, at least I personally have to watch out for. I don't want to project, project that out onto you, but yeah, um, I, yeah. I, I totally get it. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 so, so, what about in the ad space or, or marketing space specifically? Have there been any kind of things that you've, uh, like any new tools or whatever you've applied that you know you felt really strongly about and, and maybe didn't work out as you planned? So you don't have to name names, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I don't, no, I don't want to name names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't want to name names, but um, I've 
it, since I've started consulting um, with Chameleon uh, multiple years ago, uh, I've done a lot of Amazon campaigns and other paid media campaigns. And I've tried out a lot of the tools and the technology is amazing, right? Like it's so cool that they're able to add negative keywords or create campaigns. But like I've used utilized some of these before for paid search for Google and I've had some negative results where campaigns have dropped um, because it's not always the right fit, right? Like you're saying, Freddie, like some of these – tools they need like thousands of variations and millions of bu dollars of budget a month to really work and they say hey we can work with you know someone spending 10k a month or 50k a month right they can work and then they that's a real you know potential can it's not like a it's not like a thing so i've tried some of these tools before and i've had negative results but you know it's all about communication right yeah. communication is key talking to you know whoever you're working with, telling them, hey, here's why we are testing it. Here's what our test is. And if we have a negative result, we set ourselves up in a way where we can cancel it right away. And, and we've seen it, especially with Google. I've not found a tool yet that's yeah. been able to show a better efficiency yet sure. than running like Google ads campaigns sure. with strong, you know, people that people that have strong experience. Hey, I want to, by the way, say we've had some great engagement in chat today. There's a question I want to share from uh, one of the people in the audience, Robert Badcock, who's, who's just posted. Uh, but before I do that, I do want to just quickly address uh, something uh, you just said. And, and uh, worth noting, while I'm about to say this, anyone else in the audience has any questions for Josh or I or any thoughts, comments, please share them. We'd love to. Uh, make this an interactive session whenever whenever possible. Uh, so I feel like we've had lots of good little sound bites of like phrases or tests today. Uh, another one I want to bring up that I, I, I love um, is this, uh, they call it uh, in the startup world, for those of you who've never heard this expression before, they call it Wizard of Ozing. So have you ever heard this expression, Josh, Wizard of Ozing? I've not heard Oz, eh? no. I've... Okay, I love this one. So oh. Wizard of Oz, right? Who was Oz? Oz was the, the wizard who, you know, was the great magician and Wizard of Oz. Great but marketer. he actually, he didn't have any magic. He was the man behind the curtain, you know, who was the big booming voice, but he was really just a man hidden behind the curtain. So Wizard of Ozing in the startup world means that basically you don't really have uh, the technology yet and you kind of talk a big game about it but behind the scenes, the tech isn't really quite ready and you've actually got humans like doing all the work for you. And I see a lot of startups doing this Wizard of Oz thing and they kind of like fake it till they make it until they can actually do it. So there's been some like AI based bidding platforms out there, for example, around, around the ad world that, um, uh, that bid on like we're supposed to optimize your ad spend better than a human can do it. And there was a lot of questionable wizard of Oz going on in, in some of these. Um, anyway, so let's, let's, uh, let's address this question. Uh, Robert Babcock, uh, posted. So I'm going to read this out and, uh, John, uh, Josh, love to see your addresses. So, uh, uh, Robert says, uh, people seem to be increasingly sensitive to privacy. How do you balance those concerns while trying to increase reach with technologies like text messaging, et cetera? So, it's, it's a really good question, Robert, and I think about this a lot, especially because I really like to dabble with alternative industries. Uh, I'm a big fan of doing marketing in like the blockchain world. And there's there are even certain industries, financial industry, that have more increasing uh, compliance, areas of compliance that need to be addressed, right? And um, one of the things is, you know, really – learning and i've actually read you know white papers to understand the you know understand to the best of my degree the legality as well as always working with clients and working with their legal team to make sure that you know that we're taking the right approach but you know there it's it's usually a combination right of my knowledge and yes you want to take risks but you don't want to take obscene risks right because the last thing you want to do is get in trouble for you know, text messaging someone that you don't have proper rights to do, right? Thankfully, mm -hmm. if you work with a lot of the right platforms, like Clavio, if you use your text messaging tool, you can't just like upload a bunch of phone numbers and start texting them, right? Or like even MailChimp. I know that like 
I've worked with a bunch of startups that are using MailChimp, right? Just as an example, you, I think when you even upload emails, they make you certify or even other ad tech platforms that you have ownership over them and using the right proper information, yeah, right? Yeah. So I think having a healthy sense of compliance and being careful while doing growth really helps. Yeah. And then, you know, communicating with, communicating with companies on how you're really going to do it, right? So that like everyone has buy-in on the plan, right? But um, I think, you know, text messaging is a, a big one. Um, push notifications are another big one. It's just really about also, it's about figuring out the right communication cadence, not sending people too many messages because there's sometimes stuff that's technically legal, but mm -hmm. you also don't want to get hit with so many spam. Mm -hmm. Like you don't, if you're an email marketer and you could, you could technically email someone, you know, 30 times a day, maybe, right? You could technically do it, but it's not the best strategy. Mm -hmm. So it's about combining those types of methods of figuring out what the right cadence is, as well as working with the right type of compliance to make sure that you aren't overreaching or not doing anything that could be in a gray area. Well said, we couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, so I'm gonna jump subjects a bit. Uh, so we've talked a lot about growth marketing, but I wanna talk about some other um, kind of uh, let's call it emerging technology. And people are definitely wondering, hey, is it too early? Is it too late? Or is, it, is it just right? Um, so a lot of what I've learned about uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency over the you know, last five, six years specifically has been, um, you know, from the conversations you and I have had, uh, there's obviously been a lot of news about NFTs very specifically in the last year. And then even more news very specifically in the last month or so uh, when the whole world seemed to implode a little bit uh, on on this front, so um, what's your what's your take on NFTs in general and the kind of general, and then I guess the follow up to that be the general state of of that of that world right now. So I think NFTs is I think we're still at the beginning and find the right applications to utilize this technology. Right, mm -hmm. I think the application of art is really fascinating and great. Um, I've been purchasing NFTs since early last year, which was pretty on beginning of, I would say like this bull market at the beginning. I've, you know, I've purchased some, I think NFTs with utility are super fascinating using them as passes using use cases like NFTs as, uh, as tickets. I think that's a super really interesting use case, but I think it's really, I think we're seeing the beginning of adoption if it is a technology that's going to be currently widely adopted, I think we're really just at the beginning and very much kind of like 2017 with the, um, with a lot of the altcoins that kind of pushed out in the blockchain space, people that are strong and have good products, they will stay around. People continue to invest in them. The real, the real companies and projects will, you know, kind of continue to grow and will continue to find utility and strength in the space. Um, but I don't think it's too early. I think it's early, but not too early. Like mm -hmm. I think almost any brand with the right strategy and right application could find a way to do an NFT if it's genuine, right? Yeah. To do it for a cash grab, I would never recommend that. Um, mm -hmm. It becomes disingenuous on a brand level, right? But if you have a strong, if you could find a strong utility, a strong application for your brand, then you could really, I think, excel in the NFT mm. world. I think, you know, I think there's a, I agree that now is probably approaching the right time. Simultaneously, that also means that that's when, you know, anyone who is on the more conservative end of the spectrum is also starting to jump in, which now leads to the inevitable, like, dearth of complete garbage <laughs> that, that comes out there's been a lot of, of garbage already out. so <laughs> yeah but, there's um, been a but, lot of crazy projects there's yeah. it's a crazy market where there are crazy projects that make no sense at all that are worth tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars right <laughs> millions no, no logic yeah <laughs> millions no logic behind it it's yeah. supply demand a marketplace um, you know, there's also transferring of wealth. There's a lot of people that have done well in crypto and want to keep their money in the Web3 space. Yeah, and yeah. they've decided to put it into NFTs rather than conventional art or physical goods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, if, I, if I'm thinking back, by the way, we were talking about uh, 
earlier, like kind of you know, when's too early and, and a tech that we've also been early adopters in, just speaking personally for a moment, um, you know, there's a couple of key kind of companies I think people, um, you know, know me for both ones that have been successful and, and ones that, uh, you know, I didn't, weren't successful and didn't make it. But the reality is, and I don't mind admitting it, uh, I've got a whole like maybe half dozen more that aren't even on my LinkedIn. And one of them actually, and I don't think we've talked about this a long time, so long, we probably, you may not even remember, was I had a company called Digital J. And I came, it was probably like 2005 or 2006. I was partnered up with uh, the son of the founders, uh, uh, Stanton, uh, you know, the needle That's makers cool. and record player <laughs> makers. So you think cool, cool background. And we were basically making a digital download site kind of competing with, with Beatport at the time. And it was like a hundred percent flash based e-commerce site. It was really, really cool the experience, but we were just like, we were too early and we didn't have the right, the right you know, people for it. And I can think of another, you know, like I said, half dozen. Oh companies. yeah. And yeah. I have as well. I, I yeah. actually, when I worked at hopeless records, we tried to create a, a alt, um, an indie, an indie music only download site that didn't last called download punk. And yeah. it was, and I, I was heavily involved with that. Yeah. And I, I think there's a lot, a lot happens. And one of my favorite podcasts, Oh ship, of course, but how <laughs> I built this, how I built this, also a favorite one. And one of the things that I always like to listen to, because it, it's very interesting, interesting to hear how founders say this is yeah. the lock-in de decks. Right. Yeah. And there's always, there's a ton of good ideas out there. People can even work really hard to execute them. But there's always a component of luck, honestly, yeah. that helps drive it to that success, right? Yeah. And like, I'm very thankful for where I am now. And, you know, I know I've worked hard, but, you know, I know there's a small degree of luck as well that I kind do. of adds in like there's very, that very, very solid amount of luck in my opinion i mean time yeah no i'm right glad, I'm glad you agree. You know. some people are skeptical but i i yeah. believe there's a luck component and i think about that a lot when i when i think about ideas mm -hmm. and think about things like yes i could do this but also like what's the level of difficulty yeah. and yeah. you know what's the level of luck needed <laughs> to there, get to that there, next level. There, there are lots of great ideas that were executed well and everything was fundamentally right, but maybe the timing was was wrong or they just didn't have access to the right people or they're working in the wrong market. Any one number of these things can throw you off, um, which is uh, a, a great segue to my next question for you. Do you ever regret it? Or have you, or have you ever regretted it when you feel like you've been kind of too early as an adopter of a new innovative technology or approach? No, because it's kind of like, as we said before, like I, I would describe myself as a nerd or a geek in yeah. some ways. Like there's this feeling of like feeling of understanding that you're working with something new or trying something new. Yeah. Like I remember actually at my first job. I remember making my own ringtones for my phone. I'd go on my computer and I had a, I don't remember what type of phone. It was a long time ago. And it, you could figure out a way to like hack it and download your own ringtones. And I'm like, why would anyone pay for ringtones <laughs> when you could just figure out how to download and put them on your phone yourself? And then it became like a billion dollar industry for about five years, right? <laughs> like the ringtone download industry. So yeah, like big time, I don't think there's regrets. I think yeah. it's about, getting to like a point where your career you have a, a lot of experience executing mm -hmm. and being able to pull yourself back a little bit more and try to figure out where to prioritize mm -hmm. uh, efforts and figuring out the best way to do things. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 I like people who work hard and I think, it, and I, I like to think I work hard, but I think it's also figuring out how to work smart combined mm -hmm. with, finding out some of these new things. Like if it's, if it's trying a new technology, like an AI tool or, you know, or doing something in the metaverse, but if it's so hard to do and the barrier of entry is so difficult, it's like, it should be put on the back burner for a little bit, because if it's yeah. hard to do and you're passionate about it, then, you know, 
either you have to continue to invest in it and make it better for other people to utilize, or maybe mm. wait while innovations happen in this space. Yeah. I, I have a fairly strong opinion on this one I'd love to throw out there. So, yeah. you know, when I when I think about people who, um, you know, worry about having regrets uh, when, when they've adopted some new tech or they've invested in some new area and they're worried about being too early, I think this falls in, into two camps. Uh, and let's take or at least two basic ones. One is when you're kind of like, you know, you're experimenting with new tech, you're doing it in a minor, a minor space, and then, uh, you know, you're some project, low, lower risk, let's call it. And then there's the bigger one where you're like starting a company, potentially you're a co-founder, you have like your livelihood on the line, your family's livelihood, potentially investor money on the line. And so let's say a higher risk. So let me kind of divide, divide these up. I think if, if you are uh, a solo pr practitioner, or you're at your job, and you can experiment with new technologies, even if it's a little early. Um, you know, obviously, don't put all your eggs in that basket. But I, I think it's totally worth doing. And you need to, even if it fails, the accumulated knowledge that you will have make it worthwhile. When it does come around and it's no longer early, you are already knowledgeable in that subject. Your coworkers, your colleagues, your clients, your friends will see you as a, an author, you know, authoritative voice in that space. And that has value. That has value both in, um, you know, potentially career and, and your financial income, uh, uh, you know, implications. Certainly your personal brand and credibility with people. I think there's some really great reasons to be there. And, 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 and beyond all that, if you're really lucky, it's just fun. I think that's one of the things you'll see like with Josh and I, like this is fun for us. Like, you know, even when we didn't work, like, I, I was just gonna sound like, like an awesome Amazon stuff. Like yeah, that was, it was like first I, projects we did together. We we were looking at hacking Amazon. Yeah, it was awesome. It was totally like yeah. a game. Yeah. We built out a whole spreadsheet and multiple variables yeah. onto a company that had a lot of products that were very similar, but to find different ways of ranking for different keywords. Yeah, so I, I can't, we're not going to see who the client is, but I can say we took them from a million dollars to ten million dollars in Amazon revenue in one year because of basically growth hacking the Amazon algorithm. And it was so and it much was fun, early. and they were pretty appreciative. I've, yeah. <laughs> so. We had a really good relationship with them, and it was very early. But you know, as you were saying, Freddie, I think you know working with Amazon campaigns very early on was a way that I helped establish myself as a. Yeah. you know, expert in that field. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's, I think as technology changes, it's always, mm -hmm. I always find things that, you know, I think are more passionate about, but yeah, I think it's good to test things when it makes sense. Right. And like mm -hmm. there, you know, there, there's going, there's continuing to be, you know, different ad platforms on B2B, like different review sites and different types mm -hmm. of campaigns or like on B2C, you know, even TikTok and trying to find the value in these types of campaigns and finding mm -hmm. the best way to make them work, I think is hard. Like, yeah, anyone can get impressions. You know, there's a CPM, there's a cost. You can decide if you're not the right targeting there, right? But moving from that, moving from that display to the right people to getting those people to convert mm -hmm. is that whole other challenge when it comes to like mm -hmm. paid media growth. And that's where things get you know, no more, hairy. Yeah. more and more challenging as all the time, right? Yeah. With the cost of Google ads going up, the cost of Facebook ads yeah. going up, right? That's why I like to kind of work in this multi-channel yeah. mindset so that, you know, hey, yes, Google costs more, but if we can get more efficient with our existing customers and reduce churn, then, you know, we yeah. could help offset that. Mm -hmm. I do want to, and, and, and uh, I to totally agree, and then, and then going back to uh, the kind of the, the second point I wanted to make a second ago, um, you know, when you are thinking about you know, these kind of being an early adopter, I think around like, let's say a bigger situation where you're going, you know, I'm going to take all my chips and I'm going to push them on the table and be a founder or co-founder of a company potentially. And, and you're, you're making some bold moves. Look, those don't always work out. Um, I've, uh, you know, again, I've, I, I've mentioned many times on the show, you know, my, my startup guide that didn't kind of work out how I imagined. Yeah, I've always said it was the most ambitious thing I've ever tried to do, arguably too ambitious. Uh, but, um, you know, I think the big advice I would always give to people there is, 
even if you have re your regrets, you know, I have some regrets about the decision I, was, I made there, but I don't regret doing it, even though it cost me time and, and money and, and, uh, and quite a bit of heartache along the way. You have to take what you've done there and you have to channel it into something productive in your future, whether that is um, channeling that experience into a new career path, uh, like you know, I did that particular situation, or um, you know, positioning it into uh, uh, you know some new knowledge, or you know, not, just never, I guess, never stop really yearning to try and continue to innovate and and and, and be an early adopter. Um, but then I think the key is to know that that timing. So as a last and final thought uh, for today's episode, Josh, I'd love to ask you, uh, as a person that kind of you know loves uh, innovation as an early adopter, it's obviously uh, very easy to misjudge when you're too early. So you mentioned the parent test earlier, which I thought was brilliant. But are there any other tips uh, to kind of sanity check yourself uh, for when something may be, may be too early? I have another. Oh, yeah, for too early, I would definitely say the sleep on it test. <laughs> you get an idea and you could be so excited about it. And if you don't wake up in the morning and that's not the first thing on your mind. Here, here. Well, you, yeah. you got to reevaluate, right? Yeah. And I actually really like to use like sleep and daybreak as like a good way of also, at Freddie, as you were saying, channeling energy, right? So the one other rule that I like to have in kind of in the opposite way too is if you have a mistake and if you mess up in your career, everyone's had a fat finger, or everyone sent a, the wrong email to the wrong person or hit send too early or whatever you did, you can be upset about it for one day, but what you got to go to sleep, wake up the next day and get your work done and just yeah. learn from own, it. Own it and things. push through channel that energy into mm. creating something good. And you could, you, I know I have felt it. Other people have felt it. When you have that mistake, it is, mm. there can be anxiety or negative feelings. But if you could take that and channel that energy, when you wake up into like, okay, new day, what happened, happened. Let's go on. Let's mm. build, let's build something new. Then you're, mm. you know, you, you'll continue to succeed. And, you know, sometimes there's a lot of things that are like out of our control due to some of the luck or other things that are like out of our hands. So as long as you kind of put in that one other term, my wife always likes to make fun of me as I like to say, like, you kind of do your due diligence. Like as long as you put that work into it, right, you do your due diligence and you feel comfortable with the amount of effort you've put in and the right amount of effort and time that you put into a project, then and you've done what you can, then you should be able to sleep well at night and come up the next day, you know, better. I love that. Lot, lots of really great uh, tidbits shared by Josh on, on today's show. I had a great time. I hope everyone that tuned in today had a great time. I just want to thank all of you for listening, watching whatever channel you're tuned in, whether you're watching us live on YouTube or LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter, uh, or you're listening in on any of our uh, audio broadcasts across uh, Spotify or uh, you know, uh, iTunes or any, any of the platforms out there, Apple Music. Um, great. We're so thankful you're here. The best thing you can do to support the show is you know, give us a like, share it on your social feeds, or uh, you know, to subscribe and, and get other people to subscribe. So again, this is just something we do because uh, we're passionate about it. It's just something we do for fun. And it means the world to us that you're here with us. So thank you again, uh, Josh, for joining us on our ship today. And thank you, everyone out there uh, for tuning in. Thanks, everyone. Hit subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you everyone next week bye. on our ship. All right, bye.